Hello everyone, I am the Broken Hearted Liberal, and today we're here to talk about Rage After Storm. Here we go. Let's keep going. You sure? Yeah. A few weeks ago, Rage made a video called Race is Real. And how did she start off the topic of race? by poisoning her own well. That's right, her Nazi uniform needs washing. Seriously, if you're gonna open a dialogue on race, don't do that. Just don't. First, Rage goes through some pretty standard anti-regressive talking points. Certainly nothing that would stir controversy in the community. For example, when Rage says stuff like this, we do forget that it was whites who largely ended slavery. Another fun fact, Arab slave traders had actually enslaved more people than the European slave traders did. Blacks had rounded up one another and sold each other to the Arab slave traders too. Not to mention, us Europeans were also enslaved by the Arabs. She's more or less correct. So if this didn't stir up controversy, what did? About 13% of Americans are black, according to the estimates from the US Census Bureau. And yes, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, black offenders committed 52% of homicides. No, again, these stats are more or less true. Which then gives me another question to whether or not the term racism actually properly exists. Racism is a made up word. Well, heck, every word is a made up word. Huh? Right. Sounds like you debunked yourself in that one. We use words to explain new things that we describe to often make our lives a heck of a lot easier. And then we use those words to accuse people of things to help our own selfish narrative of getting our point across. The same goes with transphobia, Islamophobia, and many other words that are used for fearmongering. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Rage just explained how words work. whoop de doo Yes, words can have power. Can being the operative word here. I think everyone already knows this. Like, does this really need to be explained? And notice how these words were mostly created by minorities or people who felt oppressed. Wait, huh? All right, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. See this hot, sexy, ebony man right here? That is Richard Henry Pratt. And in 1902, he was the earliest recorded person to use the word racism. 1902. Jim Crow ended in 1960, so people were literally being oppressed and systematically at that. Sexism, Pauline M. Lee, 1868. The source is a little sketchy, so don't quote me on that. Now were women oppressed? Well, around this time, marital rape was not explicitly considered rape. So yes, I think it's safe to say at this point they were systematically oppressed. Homophobia, the 1990s. Gay marriage was only legal nationwide in the US barely two years ago. Again, systematic. Transphobia, again in the 1990s. I was unable to find any specific systematic oppression, so I'll give her that one. Have there been many individual acts? Yes, of course. Ableism. I was actually surprised to find the so-called ugly laws that banned unsightly people from the public eye. This started in San Francisco in 1867, banning Civil War vets from the streets. Those were only repealed in the 1970s. However, the earliest use of the word disableism was in 1996 on Google. So we'll concede that point there. Islamophobia became commonplace in the 1970s to the 1990s. Again, I was unable to find specific systematic oppression, so we'll give her that one as well. So Rage's accuracy here is about 50%? If we're being generous? That's a fucking F. But Rage didn't do this research, did she? No. No, she did not. And as I edited this, I sound like a fucking SJW. What the fuck have you done to me? See, this is where I think Rage is falling back on her old social justice warrior habits. You've got the historical revisionism. SJWs do this when they say stuff like only white men got to vote when the country was founded. They're wrong. Landowners were able to vote. This means not even all white men could vote at the beginning of this country. Rage even has a little bit of that SJW white savior complex thrown in. Despite the aggression probably increasing due to slavery, the white man still did a lot of good things for Africa. SJWs being mostly white, middle-class activists uplifting the poor and helpless minorities and fighting the evil white man. And as I was doing this video, I realized she even did the SJW thing of making stupidly provocative statements and then throwing a fit and blocking people when criticism comes. And Rage herself has admitted to being an SJW in the past, so this is not a smear. So I wanted to ask you, you used to be an SJW. 
Oh yes. Oh yes, so, about those dark times. Um. <laughs> continuing on. These words gave people power that would inevitably cause other people a retraction of rights. Jesus, let's hear that again. These words gave people power that would inevitably cause other people a retraction of rights. Okay, this is just factually wrong. Words do not inevitably lead to a retraction of rights. If I said teaism was people's coffeeist preference for coffee, people would think I'm the stupidest person on the planet. And there is coffeeist preference in this country. Imagine that. Somebody could proclaim themselves Emperor of the United States, issuing proclamations from their boarding house. It's only when people take actions that you get Norton I, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico. That's right, the United States had an emperor. Never heard of him? Simon Whistler did an interesting video on him. Link in the description. So if this didn't stir up controversy, what did? Not to mention, a lot of African languages prove that black people lack abstract thinking. As I would like to mention, not all black people lack it. As I said, this is just an average. The English to Zulu language dictionary has only 250 pages. And like the other African Negro languages, it does not include a working definition of any abstract concepts. Because technically, it's not possible for them to think that way or those communities to have been thinking that way. <laughs> seriously? No, seriously. Blacks can't think abstractly. Sorry, on average. Average. Well, let's just ask a very basic question then. As a non-black, where do I sign up? I mean, there must be millions of Africans who need someone to explain all these hard abstract concepts to them. Where do I sign up? I ask this because this is a very serious economic opportunity we have here. There's a vast, untapped job market out there. So where the fuck are the jobs, Rage? People's livelihoods depend on it. Where are they? Also, you specifically mentioned the English to Zulu dictionary. Well, obviously you didn't consider this word here. A word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. I checked five Zulu to English dictionaries, including one powered by Oxford. And the only one was Google, which said it meant fast food. I even broke it down into its parts. Only the Oxford dictionary attributed the first half to treatment, handling, management, or alternatively suffering. And yet this word means roughly giving is to dish out to oneself, or in other words, kindness or possibly charity. Do you know what kind of concept kindness is? A fucking abstract concept. The fact is, there are often words that cannot be properly translated. Even if they are words that do not exist, that does not mean that the concept does not exist. Because when you say blacks on average lack abstract thinking, you're essentially saying that blacks don't understand a simple enough concept as love which is quite frankly preposterous. This inferiority complex leads to the whole we was kings and shit tobacco. A lot of black people like to assume that they were Egyptian kings, which is funny because it doesn't help the whole slave thing. But nonetheless, they really weren't kings. Near to every single African slave that was bought from Africa to America came from mainly two countries in Africa, St. Gambia and Angola. Both of these countries are on the west coast of Africa and neither of these countries are anywhere near to Egypt. Mitochondrial DNA DNA proves this. The graphic of pre-colonial empires. Again, Rage is not doing her research. I just overlaid Singambia and Angola, where your source says most African slaves came from. And you see several kingdoms and empires of pre-colonial Africa within their borders. So when black people say, we was kings and shit, they're technically accurate if misdirected. Except for they can't take credit for that because there are fucking plebs, just like everyone else. Now, as primitive as you may think these empires and kingdoms were, it's undeniable that abstract concepts are needed to manage a large territory like that. There's organization, there's currency, there's trade, the Ghana Empire being based on gold salt trade as early as the 3rd century. You need a military to defend and expand your borders. A military that requires tactical knowledge, timing your attacks, coordinating your forces. Surely all of that requires abstract thinking, right? In the book of IQ and the Wealth of Nations, it talks about the IQ of the average sub-Saharan African being at 80. The IQ of an African American is normally at 85. White populations in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Europe, South Africa, and the United States score really close to one another being at around 100. 
The reason to why IQ is such an important factor is because a lower IQ causes many detrimental factors in society. These include poverty, dropping out of school, unemployment, divorce and lower rates of marriage, welfare dependency, a child's poor motor skills and development, and criminal behaviour. So then, setting out these societal differences, which is backed by data, surely should be common sense, right? Think again. We are still expected to act as if these IQ differences do not exist at all, thus assuming that these societal problems occurring are not a genetic factor, but are blamed on white people as per usual. Now, Rage's primary, quote, serious arguments came from the bell curve and its claims about race and IQ. Now, I wasn't able to read the bell curve in time for this video, but I plan on reading it soon. However, I would like to note that the book was not peer-reviewed in advance, which is something crucial when you want to say something is backed by science, so that is already a mark against it. Now, I don't know if Rage has a science background, but I do. Let's look at heritability coefficients. So heritability is measured from 0 to 1. The closer to 0 the coefficient is, the more the environment affects that trait. The closer to 1 the coefficient is, the more genetics affect that trait. Now the problem is, when Rage and others read about the heritability of traits, they often assume that heritability coefficients mean straight up genetic component, versus straight up environmental component. And this is straight wrong. Now, it's just like how correlation does not equal causation. Now there's apparently a 94% correlation between the declining numbers of pirates in the Caribbean and global warming temperatures. This is clearly wrong. Back to heredity. Genetically controlled and environmentally controlled are better terms for heritability. Now, this is an example from Indiana University Bloomington. It talks about how humans are genetically programmed to have arms and five fingers. However, that does not mean the environment does not have an effect on them. If a baby is exposed to thalidomide, which thousands of German fetuses were in the 1950s, it can develop very abnormal hands and arms. So basically, I'd like to underline this with two examples of my own. Let's say you have a heritability coefficient of one, or a 100% genetically controlled trait for brown hair. But your environment could be a bleach factory, and you'd walk around with bleach bond hair. Or you could be exposed as a baby to a chemical that kills your bulbs, and you come out bald. Remember, 100% genetically controlled, but living in an environment where you do not have brown hair. I'd like to make one more intelligence example, just to further clarify. Now, a baby has genetic factors that will give it a normal 100% IQ. The only problem is, the mother keeps dropping it on its fucking head. Now you have a retarded baby, with long-term cognitive damage. Or, let's say he or she grows up in an environment where they're constantly getting punched in the bloody face all the time. We're seeing some of these consequences happening with young kids in football. You can look that up. Now, what does the science say? Well, you could always take the TLDR version that Kraut and T posted. Subsequent investigations have confirmed that IQ is indeed heritable, although at a level substantially below 80%. And a deeper understanding of population genetics has shown that race differences in IQ could be determined entirely by environmental factors even if heritability were as high as Eisnick believed it to be. Several lines of research, etc., etc., have provided evidence suggesting that the black-white IQ gap is not determined significantly by genetic factors. Kraut also posted a second paper. Now let's look at a review paper I found. Genetics of Intelligence by Ian J. Deary, et al. What does it say about heritability? When all studies are collapsed, genetic influences on intelligence differences account for around 50% of variance. Statements very similar to this may be found in many reviews. Now, let's delve into the paper. So, first there's the Nichols review, where he reviewed 30 studies of general intelligence and found evidence suggesting a, a broad heritability of about 0.44. Now, ideologues may focus in on stuff like, Nichols is reckoned the broad heritability of general intelligence to be about 0.7. And they'll also focus in on stuff like, 79% of identical twins had correlations greater than 0.8. But then they'll glaze over stuff like, the greater correlations between the same pairings reared together suggests an influence that the rearing environment on intelligence similarity suggests an influence of the rearing environment, the environment, on intelligence similarity. They'll also focus on stuff like this. Correlations between phenotypic G, the general intelligence loadings, and genetic G, genetic intelligence loadings, were 0.88 and 0.76, the 88 figure being significant for some of them. And they'll focus in on numbers like 0.82 and 0.84 and 0.68. However, then they'll glaze over stuff like the heritability of the individual test ranges from 27% to 76% with a mean of 56%, i.e. the heritability is 56%. 
The contribution of unique environment to subtests ranges from 24 to 73% with a mean of 44%. So they'll ignore that and then focus in on stuff like phenotypic G is strongly related to genetic G, i.e. general intelligence. Or they'll look at a table like this and they'll say, oh, hey, look, identical twins had a 0.86 correlation, not realizing that these three pairings, the identical twins, the siblings, and the single parent offsprings, these three pairings actually disproves their points. If you see the pairings, it's raised together and apart. So the lower correlation in the pairs of being raised apart and the higher correlations of being raised together shows that there is an environmental influence. As you can see, the identical twins, the siblings, and the single parents, they all have higher correlations when they're raised together and lower correlations when they're raised apart. Again, ideologues will focus in on the estimated additive genetic effect on general intelligence was 0.78. And then they'll ignore shared family environment has appreciable effect on IQ when children are small, but this becomes minor when they're late adolescence. So basically the environment has appreciable effect on IQ when the children are small. Now this one I think is damning. Heritability of intelligence might not be the same for all levels of social background. When children are rescued from poverty, their IQ tends to become higher than other family members. One useful summary is an analysis in which families are dichotomized into high and low socioeconomic status. For high SES families, heritability, H2, was 0.71, and C2, which is environmental, was 0.15. For low SES families, heritability was 0.1, and environment was 0.58. That, I think, is damning. So what does this mean? It means that high SES families have a high heritability for IQ, which is fine and makes sense as IQ is indeed heritable. And if you're well off, you're going to fully be able to use your IQ. For low SES, heritability is low and the environmental factors are higher. This also makes sense as environmentally controlled factors are gonna hinder you and less doors are gonna be open and available to you. So why did I pick this paper? First, it's a review paper and compile at least five or six studies from what I remember. No, I didn't read the entire thing for purposes of time. Second, it also illustrates that you can cherry pick a lot of things from within even a single paper. Science is hard, and I'm not an expert by any means. I'm sure I made a few mistakes just coming through this paper. But the point is that you can't take everything you see at face value. You need to understand the concepts and do your research. Now, some of you are going to question the validity of this paper. So, this paper is published in the European Journal of Human Genetics. I'd like to note that the European Journal of Human Genetics was hosted by the scientific journal Nature, which for those of you that don't know, it is one of the top scientific journals of the scientific community. On top of this, this article was also published in the National Institutes of Health website PubMed, and according to them, it has been cited at least 49 times. So what does this all mean? Basically, this paper, in all likelihood, is a good paper being from a good journal and is cited multiple times as a source. Now, I'm sure me and Crowd and others are going to be accused of cherry picking or some other supposed fallacy. So I'll illustrate why all this arguing about differences doesn't even matter. And this is because, like Sargon, I believe in meritocracy, i.e. the best person for the job, whether they be black, white, trans, gay, whatever, doesn't matter. And what's the benefit in that? Well, the best person for the job means whatever company or country that a person is a part of will do better than those who discriminate based on non-merit-based characteristics. And if you think your ethnicity needs special treatment, then you yourself are basically saying your ethnicity is inferior and needs a crutch to help it up. Now that that's over, I can finally address the ethno-state part of this video. Because a little more than a week ago, I watched a video by Nightmare Fuel on Tara McCarthy. And it was at this point that I got triggered and it motivated me to make this video. And that's because Rage apparently is a big fan of Tara. So, uh, who's your favorite YouTuber? <laughs> oh, goodness me. You know, I'm a huge fan, actually, of Tara McCarthy. Um, okay, okay, yeah. I've and this is what she had to say on the matter of creating an ethnostate. All right, lots of people have been asking me this, so I'll answer it for you. How do you physically deport the millions of non-whites? And if I refuse, what then? Kill them? Okay, so this is obviously a concern that comes up when people talk about ethno-nationalism. Okay, so Tara's gonna alleviate our concerns here, right? Right? First of all, we absolutely have a right to deport all illegal residents by any means necessary, including threatening them at the point of a gun and killing them if they resist, okay? <laughs> oh man, let's hear that again. And killing them if they resist. 
Okay. By any means necessary. That sounds familiar. Oh, that's right. <laughs> By any means necessary. Jesus, these people are extremists, and they've stared into the abyss for way too long. Need to walk it back. Walk it back. Sargon did an excellent video on them. Link in the description. For Rage, my question is this. Let's just pretend you're right. Just pretend. What do you think should happen based on these conclusions you made? Yes, I know you say you get accused of wanting an ethno state, but those views combined with watching Tara McCarthy raises some serious questions. Questions I think should be answered. For Tara, if you're watching this, I think Philip DeFranco put it best. I could spend a whole video explaining the flaws in that argument. I'll just, I'll, I'll end this with a question to you. What does lead paint taste like? And I do plan on making a video on the ethno state. Let me know what you think in the comments. As I was editing this video, I watched a post-video interview Rage did. I'll just play this absolute train wreck in its entirety. That's the worst thing about it, and especially um, the amount of German people, and also, you know, when I was taught about history, I was taught at school that Hitler was the worst person ever, and he automatically had these let's kill all the Jews thoughts. But never was anyone told that Hitler helped a lot with the economy. Hitler did a lot of good things for Germany before he went absolutely bonkers, as per se. Um, which is one thing that really does irritate me, you know, the amount of people that throw around the word Nazi, the amount of people that, you know, th just talk about it as if it's the worst <laughs> thing on earth. I obviously, I wouldn't classify myself as a Nazi or anything like that, but um, there are some aspects of it where that can can be taken into account and you could say, okay, you know what, that does work well. Same with nationalist socialism. It does work well in some societies if it is implemented in the correct way. So when all these people saying, Hitler, Trump is literally Hitler, he's literally a Nazi. I don't think these people quite understand that essentially at first Nazism did have some good aspects for Germany. Not all of them. I would never say it was the best thing that ever happened to Germany, but he did do a lot of good things, Hitler himself.